Our next speaker, Jeff Landis, I've known for quite a long while, and he's done essentially everything. Uh, he's a <laughs> physicist, works for NASA at uh, NASA Glenn. He has uh, also had a distinguished career as a science fiction writer, won quite a few awards. He's even a good, good poet, which you don't find all that often. Um, and, uh, and, and generally, he, he, he's, he's a font of new ideas, and uh, he also has revisited old ideas and illuminated them. So today, though, he's going to talk about an old idea which is coming around again and which the United States has invested great money in developing but has not used, the uh, nuclear thermal rocket. Jeff Landis. Thank you. And where's the clicker for the slides here? What key? Oh, here's oh, that's the keyboard. Here's the up down that sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Ah. Thank you. Actually, I have to say that when I was an undergraduate in college and just got my first programmable calculator, the very first thing I did with it, of course, is the same thing that I'm sure all of you did the first time you got a calculator, uh, which was design the calculations for an interstellar flight vehicle with fusion propulsion, because uh, <laughs> what else would you do? And uh, you know, I have to say that the entire history of my career has been progressively focused on narrowing down less and less in scope. <laughs> So that uh, you know, eventually I get to the point in my career where the, the high point of my day is an argument over where to point the cameras on a uh, Mars rover. <laughs> so uh, so I'd, I would like to talk about the nuclear thermal rocket. And uh, I definitely have to uh, acknowledge the guru of nuclear rockets, uh, Stan Borowski of NASA Glenn, uh, for many helpful discussions uh, and arguments. Uh, although it's hard to get a word in edgewise against Stan, uh, and for uh, use of a lot of his material. So you should picture him as uh, standing over my shoulder and, uh, and saying, no, don't say that, you idiot. Uh, uh, and a final disclaimer is that these are my opinions, and they should not be considered the official views of any government agency, uh, named or, or unnamed. Uh, so our goal is going to the stars. Uh, and that's been my goal all along, ever since designing uh, fusion rockets uh, as an undergraduate. But Starflight is going to require producing and controlling vast amounts of energy. Fortunately, a couple of other people here have uh, already uh, given some examples of just how vast these amounts of energies are, but they're a lot. So to do this, we are going to need the resources of the solar system. Uh, we may need the resources of the outer solar system. We may need metals and construction materials from in space. Uh, we're going to have to do enormous construction projects in zero gravity, which is now referred to as microgravity. Uh, and we may use the solar energy resources of the near sun environment. Uh, the good news is the technologies that we need for star flights uh, can be developed in stages. And as we develop these technologies, uh, we will open up the solar system for exploration, utilization, and settlement. Well, we've gone into space, right? We've gone to the moon. Uh, the moon, as it turns out, was easy. Uh, it was the hardest project ever accomplished, arguably, in terms of a technological project, but it was easy. It's a mere quarter of a million miles away. Uh, if you do a home and transfer to Mars, it takes about a quarter of a billion miles. So Mars is a thousand times further away than the moon. So when you think, well, we went to the moon in 1969, why don't we just go to the next stop, Mars? Well, Mars is a thousand times further away. It's not just next door. Uh, the, if we do the whole solar system, Pluto is four billion miles away. The Kuiper belt extends 10 billion miles. So the solar system is big. Uh, and the short answer is chemical rockets just aren't good enough. They might take us to the easy destinations. They might take us to the next easy destination. We could go to Mars uh, with chemical rockets. But they're not going to open up the solar system. 
Well, let's look at that a little bit more in detail. I hope you're all familiar with the rocket equation. The final mass, that is the empty mass after you've burned all of your propellant divided by your initial mass with the tanks full, is exponential in the amount of velocity change you need divided by the exhaust velocity of your rocket. So this is the characteristic uh, of how efficient a rocket is in using fuel, and we call this specific impulse. And I have to mention that the engineers all use specific impulse in terms of seconds, whereas the physicists all talk about specific impulse in terms of exhaust velocity. Uh, the difference is fortunately just a factor of 10. Uh, the engineer unit, seconds, is actually by definition how long an engine producing one pound of thrust takes to burn one pound of fuel. And those of you who took introductory physics class are gritting your teeth because pound force is not pound mass. Uh, but that's where that factor of 10 is. Uh, so I'll probably switch back and forth from seconds to kilometers per second. Uh, but 500 seconds of specific impulse is five kilometers per second uh, of exhaust velocity. And I, you just go back and forth all the time. So I, I apologize in advance for when I occasionally use the wrong, the wrong units. So the best chemical propellants get about five kilometers per second. And as I think Bob Zerbin mentioned, you can easily do a rocket that can take you to about twice the uh, exhaust velocity. That gives you a mass ratio of about E squared, uh, roughly a little bit uh, less than 90% fuel and 10% everything that isn't fuel, a little bit better than that. Uh, but that's just limited by the energy and the chemical bonds. So to do better than that, you need an energy source that is just more energetic per unit mass or a source of energy that you don't have to carry on board, uh, beamed power, solar power. Uh, I've done a lot of work on beamed power, in fact, vastly more work on beamed power than almost any other transportation system. Uh, but I think other people are covering beamed power, so I'm not going to cover that here. So let's look at a rocket engine. What is a rocket engine? Really, a rocket engine just has two pieces. Uh, it has reaction mass, and it is an energy source. And the rocket engine applies the energy to the reaction mass to produce exhaust. Uh, so the energy source, in principle, does not have to be the chemical energy of that uh, reaction mass. So a nuclear thermal rocket, then, is actually kind of the simplest possible rocket. Uh, it takes a nuclear reactor, and the nuclear reactor heats, produces heat. And then you have a hydrogen tank, and you have a bunch of pumps and things that pump the hydrogen into the nuclear reactor that heats it up and expands out the, the back. In fact, really, a nuclear thermal rocket is nothing other than an exercise in plumbing. Uh, if they had the nuclear reactors, uh, the ancient Greeks could have made a, a nuclear thermal rocket. It's a, a very simple object. Well. But the nice thing about nuclear thermal rockets is this is not an imaginary technology. This is not view graphs. Uh, these are real. During the 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s, when the NASA plan was that we go to the moon and then move on to Mars, uh, they said, well, we're going to have to develop these. There were several programs, uh, one called NERVA, Nuclear Energy for Rocket Vehicle Applications, one called ROVER. Uh, a little bit later, there was a follow-on project called Timberwind, uh, which, in fact, was mostly a, a paper study. Uh, but they actually built and tested uh, these rocket engines. And here's several of these nuclear rocket engines that were built and tested uh, during the 1970s. Uh, so a nuclear rocket could very well become the workhorse of the solar system. What we have right now with the rocket vehicles are pretty much race cars. Uh, we have top fuel uh, dragsters uh, that burn a tremendous amount of fuel, but that's not what we need. What we need to develop the solar system is basically a pickup truck. So I'm going to argue that the pickup truck that we need uh, could very well be the nuclear thermal rocket. Well, here's what's inside uh, the nuclear thermal rocket, this one in particular from NERVA. Uh, these are the fuel rods. 
So the fuel rods have the uranium inside a uh, inside a, a cladding, something to hold it together. And the fuel rods all have holes in them so that you can pass uh, the hot uh, hot hydrogen into the uh, into the fuel and exhaust it out the back. So this is a fuel rod fits into the nuclear reactor. Then the nuclear reactor has the propellant feed system that expands the nuclear fuel out the bell at the back. Here's just sort of a view showing how they all uh, all fit together. Uh, these are, again, the heritage of the NERVA program, the nuclear energy for rocket vehicle uh, applications from the late 60s uh, and 70s. And a significant part of the engineering is, in fact, making sure that the hot hydrogen does not corrode the uh, fuel elements in order to, uh, to lower, the, lower the lifetime. And a couple of pictures of some some example elements here. Uh, so here's just one of the particular engines. Uh, this particular one, the XE, uh, is remarkable because it was designed to show uh, start and stop cycles. So this one had 28 start and stop cycles. It shows that it's an engine that is not like your typical chemical rocket engine. Uh, you turn it on when you get to orbit. You run out of fuel and you turn it off. But it's an engine that you can turn on, run it, turn off, turn on, run it. And uh, this particular one accumulated uh, over an hour worth of, of firing. Uh, for comparison, the space shuttle main engine runs, I think, eight and a half minutes uh, from the ground, uh, ground to orbit. And these are objects with uh, significant, uh, uh, significant thrust. Uh, some of these went up to, I think, about uh, something like 10 tons of of rocket thrust. Uh, you can do a little bit better. Here's some of the experimental materials that are, uh, in this case, a uh, US uh, for ceramic metal fuel. The object is to get it to be hotter. Uh, this particular one, I think, was Argonne National Laboratories. It turns out with the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, the beginning of perestroika and finding out what went on behind the Iron Curtain, uh, we discovered that the Russians also did a lot of work uh, on nuclear rocket engines, uh, just as good in some ways, uh, perhaps even more sophisticated uh, than ours. Here's a look at some of uh, the Russian uh, nuclear rockets, some of which have gone up to sort of an amazing uh, thir over 3,100 degrees Kelvin, a very high temperature. Uh, they went on and collaborated with Aerojet uh, looking at some nuclear rocket engines that might be proposed for advanced uh, nuclear rockets for, uh, for applications. And this just shows some of their uh, development of, of their fuel assemblies. I can't actually read it, uh, but I, what I assume it says is uh, nuclear uh, elements for, uh, for future nuclear rockets. Well, I was talking about developing the temperature increasing the temperature, and I just want to mention that that is important. Uh, basically, the hotter the temperature, the more energy you're giving to each unit of reaction mass. So the higher that specific impulse, uh, I told you I'd split back and forth between specific impulse and exhaust velocity, the higher that exhaust velocity goes. So this is 10 kilometers per second over here. So the uh, Uranium carbide and graphite comes in, oh, somewhere around a uh, little bit over 2,000 degrees C. Uh, some of the more advanced graphites go up. Uh, some of the best of these tricarbide things that are being experimented with uh, but are not actually currently been demonstrated can get a little bit higher. So the higher the temp, what the heck, why did that, why did that just go back to the end? I don't know why that went to the end, but let's move forward. Uh, some of the higher uh, temperature materials can take you up to well over uh, over 10 kilometers per second if you can get to that uh, that number of uh, coming up to about uh, uh, toward 3,000 degrees C. The uh, specific up comes to about 10 kilometers per second, and that's limited by the thermal limits uh, of the materials. 
Uh, fortunately, that's good for most of the solar system. Uh, just a couple of notes, the higher uh, chamber temperature does improve specific impulse by roughly the square root of the temperature. So if we could go up, uh, well, another factor of two, you could get square root of two higher specific impulse. Another thing to note, I've just been mentioning that these all use hydrogen as the fuel. There's a good reason for that, is that the higher molecular weight the exhaust is, the lower the specific impulse is, and that's, again, roughly the square root. So it turns out if you were to say, well, why use hydrogen? Let's use something less exotic. How about water? Uh, well, water has a, a mass of, what, about uh, 20. So you get the square root of 20 times worse performance. Uh, it's almost as, as bad as just going back to, to chemical fuel. So you really do want to use uh, hydrogen if you possibly can, although I've occasionally been proposing that lithium deuteride would be a, or lithium hydride would be a better, uh, better fuel. The lithium deuteride would be for the fusion rockets. Uh, well, but can you go beyond that thermal limit? Is really 10 kilometers per second uh, a top limit? Well, actually, no, that's not the top limit. It's just the top limit if you are thermally limited, and you don't have to heat the propellant to exhaust it. There are rockets that do not operate on temperature. Uh, you can operate uh, a rocket on electricity. So if you have an electric propulsion system, there's just dozens of ways to use electrical power to operate a rocket. Uh, however, dealing with megawatts to gigawatts of power uh, is not always easy, and it can be heavy. So electric propulsion systems tend to be low thrust, uh, whereas the nuclear thermal uh, can be a very, very high thrust system. Just showing off a couple of these uh, electric propulsion technologies. The ion engine, of course, has always been uh, my favorite. It's everybody's favorite. Uh, it's my favorite, actually, because it was developed at the lab that, uh, that I work at. And here you can see some of these beautiful blue glows. Uh, as the ions are accelerated outwards. There's others. There's a pulse plasma thruster shown over here. Uh, the Russians worked on these Hall thrusters and did some amazing work. Uh, the Hall thrusters tend to be higher power, a little bit lower uh, specific impulse. Uh, but they also have been flown in space. And these uh, have all been used. These are, again, these are not paper rocket engines. Uh, these are rocket engines that have been developed in space and in fact are flying both on NASA satellites and commercial satellites. I like to show off uh, Deep Space One. It was the first actual operational mission that used uh, ion engines for uh, main propulsion. Not the last, uh, merely the first. In fact, uh, the Dawn spacecraft right now is on a mission to orbit two different asteroids. It's now done Vesta, and it's on its way to Ceres. Uh, quite a remarkable mission. So the electric propulsion is, a, is also a real technology. It does lead to a little sort of sidebar, but is worth mentioning. Uh, if you're limited by the energy source, if you're not limited by reaction mass, but instead are limited by energy, what's the optimum specific impulse? And if you're a physicist, and if you're as clever as Richard Feynman, you could think about it for 15 seconds and say, oh, the answer is obvious. Uh, no, the answer is obvious is that if your exhaust velocity equals the mission velocity, it's optimum. And I once spent hours driving this. I had pages and pages. And when I got to the answer, I said, oh, that's obvious. Uh, because you get the most efficiency if all of the energy goes into the vehicle and none of it goes into the thrust into the exhaust mass. And that happens if the exhaust is moving at zero velocity. So the exhaust has to be thrown backward at exactly the same speed you're moving forward. And I said, duh, why, didn't, why did I do all these pages of calculation when the, the answer is trivial? Uh, that turns out not to be practical when you take it all the way to zero velocity because you need an infinite mass. Uh, but actually, that's true. Uh, any human being is more efficient than a rocket engine. If I want to jump off the Earth, I'm vastly more efficient than by pushing the Earth away at a reaction mass that is essentially infinite compared to my mass. And I'm vastly more efficient than a rocket, So, although it's not practical for, uh, for most real-world applications. But you see this. Uh, every time people design rockets, you notice the fact that the 
first stage has very low specific impulse and the top stages have high specific impulse. Uh, all of you in the audience who are, are rocket designers are, are well familiar with that. Uh, just as another uh, side note, if you can't vary your specific impulse with the mission, there is still an optimum, and then uh, that optimum is about two-thirds of the final uh, mission velocity. Actually, it's the result of the solution of a transcendental equation that is not exactly two-thirds, but two-thirds is a good mission. Uh, so if you need to go to 10 kilometers per second, your optimum specific impulse is about six and a half kilometers per second. So moving back, now that we're uh, talking, here's just some various of those electric propulsion systems. Uh, just looking at what sort of specific impulse you can get. Uh, that's a typo there. That should have been five kilometers per second. Uh, and chemical, actually, I think that would be correct if on the right side it were in uh, specific impulse of seconds. Uh, so various types of electric rocket engines can give you various amounts of performance so you can pick your engine uh, for the mission that you need. Uh, do note that the exhaust velocity is equal to the fuel efficiency, the amount of impulse you get per unit fu fuel, but it's inversely proportional to the energy efficiency. So the higher the specific impulse, the higher the exhaust velocity, the less impulse you get per unit energy. So there always is that, uh, that optimum there. So just uh, the last bit on the side note about electric propulsion. People have proposed electric propulsion usually using uh, nuclear energy. Uh, if I can talk fast and get to some advanced missions, I'll show some more of them. But I just wanted to show this one picture from uh, Mars mission studies showing that beautiful, uh, very well collimated ion engine plume on a uh, nuclear electric engine. And you can, in fact, see the nuclear engine kind of glowing red hot uh, over this direction. So, well, back to, oh, okay, a summary on electric propulsion. The disadvantage, it scales poorly to high thrust uh, because you need high power. So it works best for low thrust acting for a long time, and it does acquire a large amount of power. So electric propulsion tends to be something that's very optimum for robotic missions where you're you're perfectly good with taking a long time. If it takes you two or three years to get to speed, that's fine. Uh, humans like to go a little bit faster. The advantage of electric propulsion is it scales very well to low thrust. Uh, you can make very nice small missions, and that means it can be demonstrated and tested easily in very small systems. Uh, solar electric propulsion, you can adopt it incrementally. I suppose at this point I should point out a conflict of interest on my part. Uh, because I spent much more of my career developing solar electric propulsion than developing nuclear thermal propulsion, where I mostly serve at the, uh, as the respondent end of arguments with Stan Borowski. So I'm a little bit of a uh, conflict of interest to tell you about how great nuclear thermal propulsion is. But if we're moving into space uh, with humans, uh, we really do want the high thrust and the high capabilities of the nuclear propulsion system although I love solar electric propulsion uh, for the missions uh, that it's good for. So I guess the bottom line there is that I'm in favor of appropriate technology. That was a buzzword uh, back several years ago. And appropriate technology means use the technology that's right for the job. Just a couple of the things that nuclear thermal rockets have been very much uh, proposed for. Uh, this particular one was a study of how to get to Mars and not use a terrific amount of, uh, of launches, but yet have a, uh, a good capability of, at Mars. So it uses uh, actually drop tanks. There's a couple of tanks that drop off to give you a, a staged element. And the particular idea in this design, this is one of Stan's designs, is that it rotates about the center section so that you get some artificial gravity uh, at the crew end, uh, let's see. And here's just a view of that uh, in orbit uh, around Earth, getting ready to ignite the engines and uh, fire it off. So this was identified as the optimum propulsion technology in one of NASA's many studies of uh, 
of propulsion systems for, for going to Mars. Uh, this particular one was the design reference architecture uh, 5.0. So what they discovered is that you need to have a straw man idea of how to go to Mars in order to do trade studies of is it worth doing this, is it worth doing that, how much does that gain. And in this particular one, the fifth version of the design reference architecture uh, did use a, a nuclear thermal uh, rocket system. There's a sort of showing the, the way that it orbits end over end uh, to, to provide uh, artificial gravity. It can be used for other things. Here's the same vehicle, but now it's been repurposed to do an asteroid mission. So you start out uh, in, at Earth, you go out, uh, or sorry, start out at Earth, go out, rendezvous with an asteroid. Uh, you can stay at the asteroid for oh, a month and a half or so and come back and get back to Earth, uh, what's that about? departing uh, here in 518, 2027 and coming back at about a year later. So it's a one-year mission uh, to a, a near-Earth asteroid. Uh, there's sort of the details of that, uh, that mission, just noting the most important thing is I am LEO, one of those great NASA acronyms, initial maths in low Earth orbit. It's about 300 tons uh, fully fueled. Here's a, actually this shows switching out uh, the propulsion system in uh, Mars orbit. Uh, but a nice thing about uh, a mission is you can also, if you wanted to, do a mission to go to Phobos. And I've been very much a proponent that if you're going to Mars, probably the first thing you should do is a mission like Apollo 8, where you don't actually go all the way to the surface, but you go into orbit around Mars and explore some of the assets uh, around, uh, around Mars. If you want the opposite view, I'm sure Bob Zurbin would tell you why that's a dumb idea, that you want to go to the surface the first mission. But there's a lot to be said for going into orbit. And in fact, there's a lot to be said for exploring these uh, fascinating objects, uh, Deimos and Phobos, uh, the moons of Mars, which seem to look very much like carbonaceous chondrites, uh, a type of material that's very interesting because carbonaceous chondrites are a type of uh, meteorite that contains water uh, in the interior. So you could imagine then with the nuclear thermal rocket technology, you can start putting together an economy for the entire solar system. Water in the inner solar system is one of the most valuable materials that you can have. Uh, it's good for everything. It's good for life support. You can break it up. You can make oxygen out of it relatively easily. Uh, you can use the hydrogen as the fuel for your nuclear rockets. You can use hydrogen and oxygen together as chemical fuel. Uh, rocket is ex rockets uh, basically operate on, on hydrogen and oxygen. So, as uh, my friend Tony Zapero used to say, uh, water is rocket fuel ore. So, water is rare in the inner solar system. It's hard to find uh, because it's a volatile. But once you get about halfway into the main asteroid belt, uh, water is just another type of rock. Uh, once it gets cold, uh, there's plenty of ice, and the outer belts of the asteroids and the moons of Jupiter are tremendously abundant uh, in water. So we can go out there, we can go out to where the water is, uh, bring it to where we want it, and use it as the feedstock that can give us uh, basically access uh, with humans uh, pretty much to the solar system. I may just sort of skip over here. This is just a list of some of the things that the current uh, examination task looking at nuclear thermal propulsion uh, is involved in uh, conceptual design, uh, looking that we can do affordable testing, uh, looking forward to a development strategy. Uh, here is some of the fuel development. I think I'll skip past this. And uh, actually doing some of the irradiation testing, trying to do testing of the materials uh, with something other than a full-up uh, nuclear rocket would be. Uh, would be good. Yeah. Uh, computer modeling, of course, as well. And here is the engine design and the current plan for testing of 
uh, nuclear thermal rockets. The idea is to start with a relatively small engine, and if you think uh, this looks big, wow, it's 14 feet long. Uh, well, here's, a, here's an RL-10B. Uh, so actually, these nuclear thermal rocket engines are comparable in size to uh, engines that are currently, currently in flight. So the object is to start out with the relatively small engine and then work it up uh, to an engine that's uh, about 10 tons of thrust, about equivalent to the Pee-wee class engines of the, of the 1970s. Uh, so far, this program is still stuck at the paper stage. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of funding at NASA for nuclear thermal rocket technology, uh, but stay tuned, things can always change. With that, I would like to move a little bit on from the, uh, the boring missions, the Mars missions, and the inner solar system, and just talk a little bit about a more audacious mission. Uh, this was a study we did at NASA Glenn called HOPE, Human Outer Planet uh, Exploration. And I do have to credit, again, Stan Borowski and his team uh, for leading, uh, leading this effort. Uh, the idea of HOPE is to do a mission to Callisto with a bimodal nuclear thermal rocket uh, that can take people uh, from Earth uh, out to Jupiter's moon, Callisto. Well, uh, why Callisto, actually? Out of all of the moons of Jupiter, why did we pick Callisto? Everybody's interested in Europa. Everybody likes EO. Well, actually, Callisto is the only big moon that's outside of the radiation belts. Uh, so <laughs> Europa is great. Uh, but the very first thing we'd have to do when we got there is tunnel underneath the ice and never, never look at anything, uh, because you can't go out onto the surface, you would die. So Callisto, on the other hand, is a big icy moon, uh, and it actually may be just as interesting as Europa. It probably also has a subsurface uh, ocean, uh, but we're also interested in it uh, because it definitely has water ice. We know it has water ice because it has these uh, asteroid impact formations like Asgard uh, that are bright, uh, brightly colored. So the hope assumes as the background that we already have the nuclear thermal rocket, uh, that we're using it for a lunar transfer vehicle. Uh, here's the Mars cargo vehicle. Here's a 24-hour to the moon and back uh, vehicle and uh, space transfer vehicles. So the HOPE concept says, well, we'll start with assuming that we're already using the, uh, the nuclear thermal rocket to develop cislunar space, the area around uh, the Earth. So where do we go? Well, why Callisto again? Uh, not only are we interested in Callisto for scientific interest, although it's very scientifically interesting, uh, but we're also scouting it out uh, for its resources, uh, because it is a source of enormous amounts of water uh, in the outer solar system, which eventually we can use uh, both for uh, space transportation and also to establish uh, establish habitats. So here's just actually a view showing uh, some of those very bright regions on Callisto. The main part of Callisto is kind of dark. It has dirt on the surface. But every place that an aster blame has come in and exposed uh, what's under the surface, you see that very, very bright ice. So Callisto seems to be a moon that has a, a surface patina of dirt, uh, but underneath the dirt, uh, a large amount of, of water ice. So the ground assumptions for this one was we're departing from uh, the Earth-Moon Lagrange point, uh, L1. Uh, we're going to take a crew of six. And for some reason, they picked one-eighth of a G for the artificial gravity. I have no idea how that value, one-eighth, was picked. Uh, but they probably said, well, obviously, humans can live on the moon, so let's give it a moon-like uh, artificial, artificial gravity. So that, say, bimodal nuclear thermal rocket. In fact, we're using all three uh, possibilities. We're using nuclear thermal rockets that give you the high thrust, that's for the humans. As I told you, humans like to get places fast. They don't want to take years and years to get somewhere. We're using the nuclear electric propulsion for the cargo and fuel. And then we're also using the nuclear reactor uh, to produce electricity 
to run the, uh, the systems. So the particular one used three 25,000 pound, it's another thing about engineers, they love to use pounds for, uh, for rocket engines, but call it a 10 ton, uh, a 10 ton thrust uh, rocket engine operating at uh, about 2,900 Kelvin, about 2,500 degrees C for the, uh, the exit temperature of the hydrogen as it exits the, the nuclear reactor. So there's just a view of that bimodal uh, engine. We have a cryogenic uh, tank up here. It puts uh, the thermal propulsion by just pumping it into the uh, rocket engine. But we also have a compressor and a generator so that we can get power. So we can get both power and uh, propulsion out of the same, the same engine. Uh, just a view of the Brighton uh, compressor. This is a relatively well-developed technology. Uh, it's something that we've tested for a long period of time uh, and know pretty well that it, it operates in space. Uh, so the power conversion system for nuclear reactors in space is, is getting up there in technology, technology readiness. Uh, just an interesting thing about it, uh, nice thing about these technologies is uh, pretty much uh, true for most of the nuclear systems, uh, they really like to be scaled big. So the bigger you make it, the more power you get, the lighter weight uh, per unit uh, power you get. So big nuclear systems are, uh, are a big win. Uh, alternatively, on the other hand, uh, nuclear systems scale very poorly when they go to low power. So you're not going to use a nuclear rocket if you're going to merely be sending a, a 10 ton probe uh, or something, something relatively small. The nuclear systems are for large scale uh, use and industrialization of space. So I won't really talk about it. I said that there were a number of different technologies you can use for the rocket. Uh, this particular one, when we're doing electric propulsion, uh, we picked a magnetoplasma dynamic uh, thruster. Uh, the nice thing about these particular MPD thrusters is that they run on hydrogen and you can take them up to an exhaust velocity of almost 80 kilometers per second, which means that they are tremendously uh, low fuel use. And they operate at pretty good efficiencies. Uh, that's sort of the, uh, the thing that the electric propulsion people don't want to tell you about is that a lot of EP systems uh, just aren't very efficient. They waste most of their power. But uh, the MPD thrusters are well over 50% efficient. So more power is going into your exhaust than is going into the waste heat radiators. Uh, here's the mission profile. Maybe I'll skip that. But we have three pieces. We have a tanker that sends the fuel to the Jupiter system that we use to get back home. We have a, uh, a cargo vehicle that sends all the cargo to Jupiter. And then we have the piloted vehicle. So here's the overall uh, view. Uh, first, we send out with the electric propulsion the tanker, and it arrives. Uh, it takes its time to get there. We'll launch it in 2041. It gets there in 2044. Uh, once that's there and has been checked out, we send the humans on a much faster mission, and they can stay there for a variable amount of time, actually. Uh, in this particular one, uh, the time at Callisto, I think it was about a month and a half, and then they they come back home. So here's the, uh, the view. So here is the tanker. You can see the tanker has uh, the nuclear engine actually is way over here, just the nuclear reactor, and it's tiny. The main thing that you see, uh, this is the radiator uh, that's used for the, uh, the energy conversion because, of course, energy conversion needs a hot side and a cold side, so the radiator is producing the, the cold side. It's sort of very odd. How come that radiator is aero-shaped? And the reason is we're putting the nuclear reactor way over here. Uh, it is going to be putting out some amount of neutrons. Neutrons aren't that great for electronics and other materials. Uh, so we put all the good stuff far away from it, so we can have a pretty small shield over here. Uh, we just need a tiny little shield and all of this is in the shadow uh, of that shield. 
uh, separate radiators for the magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters, and they curl around in order to keep them within that shield. Uh, here it is just showing the size. Uh, pretty big object here. That's 192 meters long. Uh, foot, this is a football field sized, uh, sized object. Here is the next part. This is the cargo vehicle. And what you can see is you have the landers, uh, some habitats, landers, stuff, all the stuff that you need. Otherwise, very similar to the, uh, to the tanker. Uh, kind of similar in size, a little bit shorter, 177 uh, meters long. Uh, I think I can probably skip past that one a little bit, what the crew does. And here's the pilot admission. The pilot admission uses the much higher thrust. Uh, it gets you to Jupiter. Uh, and there's a view of the, the vehicle. It has drop tanks uh, for the first part uh, of the mission does a, uh, and there's the overall length of it, shows all of the pieces. Uh, the inflatable transhab is similar to the Bigelow module that's being developed uh, actually for space hotels uh, by Bob Bigelow. So another piece of commercialization that's been uh, actually pretty successful if uh, he's had a couple of these in orbit. Uh, there's a, a view. The rotation rate is relatively slow. It's 4 RPM. Uh, that gives you that. OK, actually, I had said 1 eighth of a G. That was for an earlier version. Uh, this is for the 1 G uh, version. Rotates at 4 RPM uh, and rotates uh, about the, the center. So here is a view. Once we get to Callisto, the first thing we need to do is refuel to get back home. So here's a view of the refueling tanker coming in. And we uh, drop off the empty tanks and pick up new tanks. Uh, here they are coming in, loading the new tanks and, uh, and picking them up. So then we have uh, landings on the Callisto uh, and give you, I think, about 40 days of exploration at Callisto, although that was just a, a notional number. Uh, it, actually, the mission is not terribly sensitive to how long you, uh, you stay at Callisto. Uh, overall summary, if you're interested in the details, you can probably dig up the slide and find, uh, find the details. But here's the, uh, the, the bottom line, the initial mass at L1. Uh, so these are ranging from about 300 tons to the most mass of them, about uh, 460 tons of the fully fueled uh, vehicle. Here's an interesting thing, actually. I noticed that the, I mentioned the, the mass fraction varies with the specific impulse with the uh, exhaust velocity. You can see for the human vehicle that uses the nuclear thermal rocket, we're getting about 18% mass fraction. So that means that, what, 82% of the vehicle is fuel. Uh, with the much more efficient electric propulsion, the magnetoplasma dynamics, you get a much higher, uh, a much higher fuel ratio. So the total mission is just about five years uh, at the Jupiter system. Uh, supporting uh, technologies, uh, we do assume that we have uh, L1 to low lunar orbit uh, abilities. We do have assume lunar facilities, and that we have. Uh, pretty much a lunar economy already going that can give us uh, of ice at the Lagrange points. So the summary is it looks like the nuclear thermal rocket will take us at least all the way out uh, through the solar system, out at least to the moons of Jupiter. Uh, and it really does look like pretty much a workhorse uh, that we can use to open up the solar system. So. It can open us to solar system exploration, uh, but it's still a little bit low exhaust velocity uh, to go to the stars. So we need something else, fusion, antimatter, uh, beamed energy. Well, stay tuned. Uh, maybe we'll hear some more about that uh, in a moment. Thank you. Thank you.